everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz, and I am very happy to welcome back our friend John Barclay. Hey, John. Hello, Nicole. Thanks for having me back. John is here to present how he is crafting his images lately with the Topaz plugin software. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Nicole, and thank you for Topaz for having me back yet again. I think this is number 18 or 19, something like that. So I appreciate that there's interest in the things that I care to share. Um, so today, I thought we'd uh, we've spent a fair amount of time on uh, the new little playground called Texture Effects, and I will actually use that today. Uh, but I thought we'd go back to some basics too, uh, to those who are joining me again uh, or coming back again to see what I'm showing this time. So you know. Topaz was built on this neat program called Adjust, and it's still as good as it was years ago when I was first introduced to it, and that really was my introduction to Topaz. So I thought we'd spend a minute uh, reacquainting you with with Adjust and the power of it. And then, you know, the last couple of webinars I did, I tried to um, uh, cover black and white, and I felt like I just went way too fast. So I want to slow down a little bit on a couple of these black and white images here, the third and the fourth image and make sure that we have a, a good understanding of how powerful that tool is. And then with the horses, I thought we'd uh, introduce you to impression. And then we're going to use impression and uh, texture effects on this little still life scene here. So I'm going to jump into Photoshop where I've already got some things lined up to help us move along a little more quickly. So let's first take a look at adjust. And it just, the way I see it is, uh, where I use it uh, primarily for is if you want to make a really quick adjustment, or I like to introduce uh, adjust to people who maybe are overwhelmed by the whole image processing workflow and working on a raw file and all that you need to learn to do that. And so if you're relatively new to image processing, I'm hoping to show you just real quickly on this image, then we'll build upon the concepts on the next image the real meat and potatoes of what Topaz adjusts. So real quickly here on the left side you have all sorts of uh, presets that you can go through and you can see you can get a thumbnail view of that. Uh, and this is for the, the collection that I'm looking at up here in the top left. If I click on the classic collection then I'm going to have all of these presets. And so that's a good way to see what the Topaz has made as a preset might look like. But those who know me, I rarely ever use presets. I want to understand what's going on the right side of any piece of software so that I can then make it what I want to. So for now on this image, I just want to introduce you to the real key meat and potatoes of what Adjust does. So instead of like other programs where you have a one button auto adjust, Topaz Adjust allows you to almost have an infinite adjust slider and then attach regions to it. Okay, so let's see if we can help you understand what these two sliders mean. And this is where I am here is on this adaptive exposure and then regions. Adaptive exposure is like that 1 to 100, if you will, on making it or, or like a, a one-click auto adjust, if you will. But it, rather than one click, I can have it auto adjust to this much, to this much, to this much, right? So let's maybe say from one percent to a hundred percent. But what makes this so unique and different from everything else is the region slider says that the further over to the left I am, the fewer of the regions of that image that are going to be affected, meaning maybe the dark darks and the light lights. But if I, the more I move this slider to the right, the more of the tonalities, maybe that's a better way to put it, the regions in the image or the tonalities of that image that are going to be affected. So let's see if we can make that make sense. I'm going to pull this up a little bit to here. And notice if I have it way down here, not a lot's being adjusted. Pull it over a little more, more is adjusted. Pull it over more, more, more. So the, the adaptive exposure stays the same, but I'm including more regions or more tonalities all the way until it's looking rather garish right uh, um, so how would I normally use this and why is it still a viable tool I typically bring this over like this and like this and just that quickly we go from before after 
pretty significant difference while holding back those highlights, opening the shadows on the horse's nose, right? It's, it's a little bit dark because of where the sun was. And then Topaz adjusts, so the adaptive exposure has done a good job of opening that up. If I push that too far, it starts to have that faux HDR look, so I would caution you against that. And then regions, it really depends. There are times where I'm going to go all the way to the right and keep this rather low. There are some times where I'll go pretty much 50% to 33% and adjust just out the, the outside regions. So just a quick reintroduction to Topaz Adjust with a, an image I always use for it because I think it really does a good job of being kind of in your face as to what it does. So let's get rid of that real quickly and let's move over to the next one. So let's move down to Cuba, the topic of the day, right? Uh, the president is down there. There's a baseball game going on down there today. Kind of interesting times uh, down in Cuba right now. So what would I do in, with this image and then maybe add a little bit on top of that? Let's go to that same adaptive exposure, and this is not bad. I did my work in Lightroom and did what I thought was necessary there, but it still has a darkish feel. So I can do the same type of thing I just told you before, and very quickly add a fair amount of life to this image by doing that. Now, just spend a couple of minutes on the other sliders. They're pretty uh, straightforward. Contrast and brightness does pretty much what you want to do. However, what I've learned over time in using this program is, you know, sometimes if I was showing you, if you push this, you can start to get an HDR-ish look. A little trick, if you pull back on the contrast just a little bit, that'll help tone that kind of garish look down. Because when you're using adaptive exposure along with the regions, you're really working on the contrast. And that's what's starting to create that kind of over-process look. And so by going to the contrast slider, you'll notice I pulled that down and it's a lot more natural looking. Pretty aggressive sliders, by the way. They're not subtle. They're pretty aggressive. So again, before, after. Pretty dramatic look, especially back behind the car. We've really given some depth to the image and able to see uh, into some of those darker areas. Okay, so color I typically do in Photoshop or Lightroom. Noise reduction I would do with denoise. Uh, but I do want to take a minute on this detail slider. So if you're into that HDR look, there's no better way to accomplish it with a single image in my mind than to come in here and start really pushing this strength slider. And then you can actually boost the strength. And now you're into that really grungy, cartoonish look. So... Oftentimes in the webinars, I'm asked about why do you use detail versus clarity versus you know uh, this detail slider and adjust. Well, as you can see, you don't have to move this very far to really start to make it look overdone. So if I just want to add some clarity to this, you know, sharpen it up, crisp it up, give it pop, I'm going to go into clarity, that Topaz's clarity product. I'm not going to do it here because this tends to be pretty aggressive, but you should be aware that it's there because you, that might be what you're looking to do is create something that's aggressive. Now, one other little thing. This wall starts to get a little darker here than I would like it to. You do have a local adjustment brush. You can go open that up here. I'm on the right side. Actually, you know what? Let me see. Yep. On the right side, and I'm going to use my dodge tool, right? to make it a little brighter. And I can change the brush size here. I can change the opacity of it, meaning how much is it going to uh, take away. So if I now paint on this, and you notice there's two circles, right? So the inside circle is where you want to be painting with. The, out, the distance between the inside circle and the outside circle is the feather of the mask that you're painting with. So typically, you want to have your brush size no bigger. Otherwise, it's going to bleed over into areas. And notice with my opacity down around whatever it is, 27%, if I let go and now I paint again, it's going to brighten it up by another, um, you know, 27% is what's going to happen. So you have the ability from within... Uh, from within adjust to go to local adjustments too. So if, if that adaptive exposure is overdoing something, uh, then you can go in there and brighten it up or tone it down or what have you. 
So that's what I wanted to cover on, on Adjust for today and just remind you that it is a very powerful tool that works very quickly. Sorry about that, folks. I forgot to turn my, um, my phone off, so I am going to do that right now. All right, let's talk about Topaz's black and white effects. Uh, here we are down in Cape Cod. You, you may have seen this picture rolling through in the, in the opening as Nicole was introducing me. That's a, be a good photograph to take a look at, I think, here. So let's go here. And let's go to black and white effects, too. Because there's a lot of meat in this program, and so I wanted to, as I said the last time we've spoken about this, I haven't taken the time that I really wanted to. I'm going to reset this. Bottom right, I can do some resetting. Okay, same thing. The interfaces in Topaz are great because they're all very similar. So once again, if you want to look through a traditional collection, you can come hover over these and see what you want to pick. Maybe an easier way to do that is there's a grid. I'm up here at the top again, right next to the word traditional collections. If I click on that grid, it's going to give me a whole bunch of choices here that I can scroll through. If I like one, I simply click on it, and then it's going to apply that preset that way, so you can do that. I'm going to hit reset again because, again, what I want to do is introduce you to, to, the, the, to the workflow here. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, icons here. The main ones that you need to worry about, in my opinion, are the filters just like we had in the days of putting filters on glass. So if I click the red, you notice it changes the sky a little bit. The orange will change it a little bit more. Yellow a little bit more. Green, blue would do what you're thinking with. There's a lot of blue sky, so it's going to make that bright. And the last one is neutral. So I tend to go through and click these. But I, what I want you to look at, and this is really important, is look at this down here, the color filter. When I'm clicking on each of these, you pay attention to these two sliders. And they're going to change. They're basically what the preset is on that hue scale and the strength scale. Why is that important? Well, because rather than being able to click just one filter, I now have almost infinite control. I can come down here and I can take the strength slider and leave it as a yellow. Basically, I've chosen a yellow filter, but I can now push that strength up and really work on uh, darkening and giving depth to that sky, which is what I would do. Okay, so First, we learned that that's my workflow is to click on the, the color filters and then tweak that as I wish. And again, you can do that with this one as well. So if I want to see what happens as I go along the, the hue continuum, if you will, I can tweak that ever so slightly. So it gives you a lot of control as to how you're placing those tonal values uh, uh, based on the colors that were in that photograph. What's the next thing I would do? I would go to color sensitivity. This is different. This is now being able to work on each individual color that's in the photograph. So we would think there's a lot of blue, right? So if I come down to blue, I can enhance just the blue even more or brighten that blue by picking the blue slider or the cyan slider. There is some cyan closer to the horizon, so I can darken that. And then the yellow should affect some of the boardwalk, and I can make some adjustments there. Green, I'm sorry, red probably not going to have a whole lot. So that tends to be my next step. So I pick the color filter that I like for the overall global effect, and then I open up my color sensitivity so that I can work on each of the tonalities in that image that exists. Okay, we'll close those up for now. Now, part of why I wanted to speak to you about adjust is because, guess what? Under, uh, I'm sorry, under adaptive exposure, look what we have. We have our friend, Topaz Adjust, built right into black and white effects. So why is that important? Well, let's bring this all the way down. So here's where we started. Not a bad looking black and white photograph, but look what we can do especially with the regions. And the thing that I'm really excited about here is in this area of the boardwalk on the right side, it was feeling a little blown out. Let me turn this off. So there it is without the adaptive exposure capability or essentially adjust built right in. 
And here it is turning it back on. I've added a whole bunch of depth and detail and held back those highlights really nicely in this area. Now that's not in obviously anybody else's program because that's what Topaz brings to the party. Um, and protecting shadows and highlights are pretty self-explanatory uh, there. Um, so you might ask what are all these up here? Well these are kind of quick presets. They're going to lighten it by a, a little bit or darken it by a little bit. They're just quick and I tend not to use those to be honest. Um, I'd rather do my adjustments here. So if I need to lighten or darken something, I'm going to come into, you know, my contrast and add contrast if I want to, and I'm going to brighten it or darken it, you know, that way myself to taste. That's what I prefer to do. Okay, so that's on this image where I wanted to go with. I always like to take a look at my time here. All right, um, let's let's hit the cancel out of that as well. And move on to the next one here. Okay, so let's let's build upon a little bit here this black and white concept. Now we're moving to Tuscany. So where we went from Cuba to Cape Cod to, to Tuscany. Okay, let's reset because it's going to remember what we did uh, on the last photograph. Okay. Same thing, same process. You know, we're going to use something that makes sense. There, we're not seeing a lot of difference because there wasn't a lot of tonality going on uh, in this image. I mean, it was uh, not a whole lot of colors, rather, going on in this image. Uh, but I can certainly play with the strength and see if that yeah, that punches up a little bit. But now what I want to do is I want to go up and introduce you to um, the, the zone display here. So if we go up to the top right again, I'm up here and where it says Z, if I click on that, this is kind of based around Ansel Adams zone systems, what we have here. And so depending on what number in the zone, the zone comes from zero to nine, right? Or 10 rather. I can see if any of those are in my image. So I'm going to turn off five and I'm going to go all the way to 10. And we can see in here that I've got some, uh, highlight some whites that are blown out. So we've got to be really careful not to do that. So it's a really good guide. And again, that Z is at the top right. That's basically the zone system. It gives you a good visual reference with different colors to understand where you might be blowing out or blocking up uh, information. So I wanted to introduce you to that. But once again, I'm gonna, this is where we're definitely, whoops, I keep opening the wrong one. Sorry, we'll go to adaptive exposure. And we can use adaptive exposure here too, and it's really doing a nice job of giving this a lot more punch and depth. And we'll probably want to protect those highlights a little bit and bring those down just a touch. And then what I want to talk about here is just like we talked about in adjust, we go to local adjustments, open that up. And we're right back to a very similar, comfortable dialog box. Once again, I'm going to want to dodge in this particular case. I can check the brush size again if I want to, and the opacity and the hardness of the brush. So I'm going to bring that up and make it so it's a feathered, feathered about like we had before. The edge aware, I'm not as concerned about on this one, but edge aware is a really great tool and it's done really well by Topaz where it senses what the edges of something are and tries not to bleed beyond that. Uh, but in this case, what I wanted to do, I'm going to make that a little bit smaller actually, brush size, because that about this. This area right in here, and I am going to bring the opacity down to about 20% because I want to do this very uh, slowly and build it up. I'd like to build this up and make it a little brighter. I'm going to make that brush just a little smaller yet again. And I can come in here and you can start to see, I've overdone it a, a little bit here, but you get the idea is all I want to do is I can make this and you can see the, um, the mask over here on the right where I'm painting and I can brighten that area. I don't like what I've done there. So you could go back and, and erase that out again. I'm not going to take the time to do that. Um, here we go, the overall strength I can bring down too. So this is, think of the overall strength as, as an opacity slider, if you will. 
but it, I just wanted to point out to you and add to the concepts in, in black and white that you have the ability to do some local adjustments or of course if you're proficient and more comfortable in Photoshop you can do as much of the work on uh, the black and white processing in here as you're comfortable doing and then move into Photoshop and do some of your work there but I wanted to make sure you were aware of the tool that existed. Uh, and finishing touches are things borders and vin vignettes and quad tones and silver tones, right? So if you want to do some nice sepia toning, you could do that. And it not only does it automatically put some of that toning in, but you have all the control to change what that strength is or change what the hue is. You can make it blue or selenium or whatever you choose to do. Uh, be mindful, though, that um, Nicole spent a ton of time, so let's just do this real quickly. I'm going to reset. She spent a ton of time on toned collections. So if you really do like certain looks, that's just going to take, just give it a second here where we'll build some previews. But look, you have all sorts of toned all the way down to sepia, selenium down here, all sorts of wonderful uh, toned looks that you can start with and then tweak those. Okay, so remember anytime you click on a preset over here, so if you went to sepia 1 and click that, that's all fine and dandy, but you can come over to the finishing touches, open up that uh, what's going on there and tone it down if you want to, right? So. It's just a starting point is all it is for you to then build and craft the look that you're looking for. Okay, so let's see. Now we get to play a little bit. And let's uh, re reintroduce you or introduce you, if you're not aware of it, to another fun little program called um, Impression. And this was out at a, a dude ranch. We were just out, uh, did a workshop there, and boy, did we have a whole lot of fun photographing the horses. We were hoping for a little bit more snow. That's a pretty robust program, so it's going to take a little bit to build all these previews. So just give me a second here for as those uh, come along here. Now, in this case, the, the interface is slightly different. You're going to have a bunch of presets on the right side, and these are the featured ones. And then you're going to have different subcategories if you want. So if you're looking to do impressionistic type looks, you can go to that category and just be looking at those or painting or, or what have you. Um, it's going to have to take time to rebuild those, so I'm not going to do that but I am going to come down to this one called Impasto one. It tends to be something that I like to, to look at. So once we find a particular look that we like, and again, understand that this is a preset and something that we're going to be able to modify, we have these sliders that are in the middle of it. So I'm looking at the blue highlighted square here. That's the one I've clicked on. I'm going to click on the sliders, and that opens up my ability now to um, change the brush choices. So I can come down to all sorts of different brush choices, and when I do that, it'll have a pretty dramatic effect on the look in the photograph. Okay, so that's one choice I can make. I can change the paint volume. I can change the brush size. Sometimes that has a, a bigger impact than not. The brush size, in this case, can have a big impact. Make it a little bit smaller. You'll gain back some of the detail on the riders. Stroke, uh, stroke variation, the color. You have all of these, and the spill kind of smudges things out, or, or spills more paint, and then the smudge smudges it out further, right? And so. You can go on and on. This is a much smudging gives you that much smoother, almost if you have glow already, it's it's sort of giving you that glow type uh, fractalis look almost in this case. So I'll bring those back just a little bit. And then color and lighting and texture are, are I think, again, pretty self-explanatory. Those you're just going to play with. Uh, you can choose different textures and canvases to put this on or, or bring the strength all the way to zero and say, I don't want any texture at all. But it is a, just an absolutely wonderfully fun piece of software if you like the painterly look to create all sorts of looks. Now, before we leave this and go on to one other, uh, one other image here to spend some time on, let's say that you're at this point 
you can certainly now come to the bottom left side and you notice you have a strength slider. Once again, strength, opacity, they to me they're the same uh, or synonymous here. So you can rein back a little bit of that painterly look here if you want to. So you're still before, after. Now by reining that back to about 70%, I do have some detail in the faces of the riders and the horses, but I have created a much softer painterly look to this that looks a little more realistic than over in your face a uh, painted look. And what I might do and what I often do is I would have created a layer to start with for, in Photoshop, then I would have done this work and then in a layer and a layer mask in Photoshop I can be even more specific in painting out the painterly look that I'm creating with impression and, and making sure to have it be exactly what I want. Okay, so hopefully that reintroduced you or got you excited about um, impression because it is a lot of fun. Okay, so in this one I think I will just create a duplicate layer so that we can maybe show what's going on. So let's go right back in this image to impression again. I like to do uh, repetitive things because I think it drills home the concepts and again, sorry this is going to take a little bit of time to to build the previews, but hopefully it'll be worth the time here. Let me see. I want to go down to. Uh, actually, I do think what I want to do on this one is go to painting, and then, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of great choices here. Yeah, I think it was. Let me look at my notes here. Let's go to Rembrandt too when it gets these all done here. Awful lot of work going on there. Okay. In this case, I'm just going to accept it as rim. So here's what we got. We've taken this neat little still life um, and we've added some painterly look and feel to it. And I will just bring the uh, strength down just a little bit. And we're going to hit OK on that. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is outside of uh, Topaz products, I'm going to go up to my hue saturation layer here and I'm going to bring down some of the saturation. Now why am I going to do that? Because I'm going to start to use texture effects to uh, build in some different colors that I would prefer. So by bringing down the saturation, I'm getting rid of some of that color that came in from the painting program, but I'm still leaving behind that textury look of painting that I was after. Okay, so now I'm just going to squash that for a second. Okay, add another layer. Uh, let's go here. Okay. Now let's go to, whoops, sorry, why is that not collapsing on me? There we go. Okay, I made a stamp layer is what I wanted to do and I forgot I had, hadn't clicked on a specific location. Photoshop can be fussy. Okay, so now we're going to open up texture effects. All right, which is the happy little playground we've been talking about in the last couple of sessions. Hey, look at that. There's an update available. I better do that. Okay, so real quickly again, you know, pretty robust piece of software. Hopefully in the last two webinars or others webinars, you've gone out and looked and know how to look for different groups, right? So you have favorited groups. You can have earthy looks, and it's going to give you those presets for those looks and so forth. But if you want to build something new and on your own, you're going to go way to the top right up here and hit new. And now we have a blank slate where I can choose any adjustment that I want to make to this particular image. So to do that, I'm just going to hit the plus sign to add an adjustment. In this case, I want to add an, a texture. And what I want to do in this case is the normal default blending mode that is brought up here is normal. In this case, I'm going to go to soft light. And just by way of review for a minute, you can add all the textures you want here. Uh, and I've done that. So I have a whole bunch of textures, and I'll show you how to add those in a minute. But I'm going to go to my flypaper metallic. And I'm going to go somewhere like 
Down to here, let's see. Oh, let's see. How do I... Okay, so this is adding a little bit of color. You're going to notice I can bring the opacity slider up and add a little bit of more of that texture to it from, from that texture. So just so you're aware here, so let's kind of slow down just a sec. So I've gone and added the texture. I can pick from all of these textures that I've added or the ones that come with texture effects. And now I can see those previews and I can hover over them, right? And I can get a, a preview. Matter of fact, I think I like this one better for the moment. Now I can really see that texture. I can affect that texture by the different blend modes, so whether it be normal, dissolve, darken, all these will have a different effect on the relationship with the background photograph and the texture that I'm using. And then this opacity slider, while I'm in this texture layer, this opacity slider is affecting the opacity of that texture, right, and how much of that is showing through. So I can push that up, I can pull it down. Okay, I can flip that texture by clicking this way, and sometimes I'll want to do that because I want the darker part of that texture in the left side or the right side, or I can flip it upside down. I can move that texture if I want to by hitting the Move tool and moving it around. Okay, so all sorts of capability from within here to work on your textures. I can change the size of the texture and make it bigger or smaller with the slider, and then if I make it bigger or smaller, I can slide that texture around to wherever I want it. Okay, so that's how we interface with, with that texture. And then if I, so the opacity shows how much of that texture is showing through. One last little key here, the little trick, is this detail slider is only going to affect the detail in the texture, not the background image. So I can really bring forth that texture if that's what I want to do. In this case, I don't want to. But what I want to show you is you don't need to stop with one. So if I want to add now one more texture, I go to the bottom right again where it says Add Adjustment. I click. And these are all the types of adjustments I can make. In this case, I just want to focus on another texture. I'm going to go to soft light again. I'm going to come into uh, the, my metallic, uh, flypaper metallics again. And I can pick something kind of earthy. Let's go uh, maybe a little darker brown. I'll well, maybe add some color to it. No, I still like this one. So we now we're starting to build up different tonalities, and that's what you do. So if you want to add more blue or, th or this rosy type color or whatever you want to do, that's why I call it, it's like having a box of crayons, right, and just playing, and as you hover over, the key for me is to change the blend mode so that you can see what's going on as you hover over these. And notice how quickly they change. They change very quickly on the fly, so you can get a really good idea of what's happening here um, as you go over these various uh, textures. So we'll, we'll just go to this one for now and just for argument's sake we go down to texture again and maybe I'll come into let's say summer painterly and you know you want to add this particular look and that's under normal so I'm going to come down to soft light and notice how different it is but if I pull this slider up the opacity slider notice now I'm adding in and in this particular image I kind of like what this is doing I like adding that kind of greeny uh, tonality into it so Let's go backwards here. I, there's eyeballs on each one of these textures. I'm at the top right of the screen right now. I can click off what I've done. So there's the last one, the middle one, and the first one. So each of them have had slightly different effects to create either the texture that you're looking for, or in my mind what you're really doing is you're doing both texture and tonality, and that's the reason you're going to do multiple textures off times, because you're looking to grab the texture that you're getting out of one, but then you're grabbing another texture because you want to add a slightly different tonality. Okay, so just to, to kind of wrap up a little bit here and make sure that we cover a couple of little things just to, in case you're your first time looking at texture effects. You have lots of choices here. So I could go in now and say, let me add a basic 
adjustment. And all it's doing is, right, so here's my texture one, texture two, texture three, and now there's a basic adjustment. And so these sliders that I'm seeing now relate to the basic adjustment panel. What can I do here? I can brighten it up if I want to, and that's a nice little thing to do. I can open up the shadows just a touch or darken the shadows up. I can work on the highlights and maybe accentuate that light that's coming in here, which I think is a nice thing to do. The clarity in this case is going to be the overall, you know, grunging up, if you will, of this this look. So clarity is like the clarity slider, somewhat like the clarity slider in um, their clarity product. And of course, you can. These are pretty self-explanatory with with regard to saturation, temperature, all that stuff should be pretty self-explanatory. And by the way, it, there is a brush capability. So you know, if I really wanted to push up this brightness but I didn't want that brightness um, to be affected. So I could go to this brush and I can mask with black or white. So I can conceal or reveal, right? Black conceals and I can come in here and I can paint out with a mask because I didn't like that brightness happening on these two areas in this image, what have you, right? Again, I'm not doing these really carefully and making little subtle mistakes. I would be I'd be using my Wacom tablet and a brush to do these if I was doing working on my own image. Just want to point out to you, just by way of review, I can do a basic adjustment, and then to that adjustment, I have masking capabilities built right in uh, that we've been discussing with the other programs. I can go down and add a diffusion layer, and diffusion is really kind of nice actually. It adds a nice soft diffuse look. And so if you want to add diffusion, you can, do, you can start to see that there. You could do that. Same thing. You have a brush capability and you can say, okay, I like that, but I want to take, I want to keep the sharpness on, on this can and on the, uh, uh, the little box there, but add some diffusion in the background. And then you can add light leaks and film grain and edge exposure and dust and scratches and on and on and on, uh, more than we have uh, time to cover, actually. Uh, but just, just know that this is an insanely robust piece of software, and if you have any creative inclination whatsoever, it's just an endless playground to, to exercise your creativity uh, in doing texture work. So hopefully we've added a little bit to, for anybody who's seen the first two uh, webinars where I talked a lot about this, pretty much spent the whole time talking about texture effects. And by the way, you can go back and look at those on their website if you need to. But this should have added even a little bit more insight into how to maybe use it to go even a little further than, than we've been speaking about before. And then even combining it in with impression to give you a different starting place. Or quite honestly, at this point, you could be finished here and go into impression and add this painterly effect or look to it at that point. So. Uh, after all that work, I think I'm going to actually save that one. <laughs> so I think we're getting close. Uh, you know what, though? We started a few minutes late. Hopefully, Nicole's going to let me go a little bit longer. Let me go into Lightroom here. Uh, what do I want to do? Let's do one, because this, this one should just take a second. Oh, and I know what I forgot to do is tell you how to get the textures in, didn't I? Sorry about that. So we can do that right now because that's where I'm going to go again. Okay, so let's go into filter. Okay. Okay, so we're going to uh, reset because that's sticky settings. Remembers everything we did the last time. Okay, so let's go back. We're back in texture effects. I'm sure somebody out there is saying, how the heck do I add my own like flypaper textures? And I'm a huge flypaper fan. Well, what we do is that right next to where it says all or where I'm you know, grabbing my flypapers or what have you, right next to it, there's a little box here with a down arrow. If you click on that, it brings open the dialog box where you add these. And I've got a whole bunch in here, but you, you would see a small screen and you would have been able to see add a category. You're simply going to click the add a category, name it whatever you want, and click OK. And then once it's there, let's say your category was, you know, flypaper painterly, 
Then what you're going to do is click on the flypaper painterly. That's the one you just created. Click on the word import and then go find wherever you have downloaded those two and hit open and then it's going to do just like it has here for me. It's going to load all of those textures into texture effects so you have them. And if you have a bunch of them that you just don't use, they do take up resources. You can go in here and trash them if you want to. Uh, and then once you have those loaded, then they will reside here. So I've opened up a new texture and I can go in here and there's flypaper painterly, some of the paint, yada, 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 on and on and on, right? And that's where you would find those. And now when you click on those, that particular grouping is all you're going to see here. Okay, so I'm going to trash that layer and just do one last thing and then we'll be done. There's a cool thing called double exposure. And so same thing, if you want to put images in here, um, you can do that the same way to be used for double exposures. So same thing, you click on the down arrow box and in this case now you're adding double exposure images and so that's what I did. I created a category called my images for double exposure and did the same thing and then I imported them and now they're available when I pick and let me just, I'll, go, I'll do this again here so so I go all the way back. So all I'm doing now is I'm going to add an adjustment. In this case, instead of a texture or a basic adjustment, I'm going to do a double exposure. And in this case, I'm going to go get the same picture of this and then I'm going to flip it sideways and then you can change the to multiply and on and on and on and you can have you know a multiple exposure if that's what you want to do or you can add a horse in there and this is kind of cool I like this look um, where you have the rider in sort of silhouette and then you have uh, the multiple exposure that I brought in there a little more uh, reserved in the in the background kind of a composite type image anyways it looks like we're kind of running out of time here and we want to save some time for some questions so hopefully you got some ideas of how to use a, a, a few of uh, the good the great topaz products here we're getting a ton of great feedback John thank you so much this has been awesome yeah. Good. Um, if you want to follow John, you can do so at BarclayPhoto.com. We had several people, John, ask about your upcoming uh, workshop. So anybody okay. who wants to know about that, that's where they can go, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And then we have our Facebook at John Barclay Photo, Instagram at John Barclay Photo. And if you have any questions for us that we weren't able to get to today, you can contact us at webinars at topazlabs.com. You can also sign up for upcoming sessions at topazlabs.com slash webinars. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. John, thank you again. You're welcome. And thank you. And go follow on Instagram. I'm actually doing a lot of Instagram now and hope to see you on Facebook. Awesome. Take care, folks. Thanks right. for joining. Thank you. Have a great evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever you are, and we'll be talking to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.